hundreds of miles of parkways and expressways, and dozens of bridges and tunnels, now connected the city to the suburban reaches of Long Island and beyond. Hundreds more had been driven through the outer boroughs themselves, weaving together, as Moses himself declared, the loose strands and frayed edges of the metropolitan arterial tapestry. But in all the frenzy of construction, the master builder had never been able to penetrate the heart of Manhattan itself with a superhighway. And in 1961, he resolved to do something about it, fixing in his sights a low-lying area of lower Manhattan, stretching from Chinatown in the south, up through the wayward lanes and ancient side streets of Greenwich Village. We simply repeat that cities are created by and for traffic. A city without traffic is a ghost town. The area between Canal Street and 3rd Street, a strip three quarters of a mile wide, is the most depressed area in Lower Manhattan and one of the worst, if not the worst, slums in the entire city. Robert Moses. Condemning the West Village as a slum and the old cast iron district to the south as an obstacle to the free flow of traffic. By 1961, he had set in motion two immense federal initiatives. A vast urban renewal project that would level 14 entire blocks along Hudson Street in the village. And an eight-lane elevated highway, one of his most cherished dreams, that would drive straight across the heart of lower Manhattan, from the East River to the Hudson, destroying thousands of historic structures and displacing nearly 10,000 residents and workers. It's difficult to even make anyone understand what would have happened. He would have bulldozed a swath about 225 feet wide right across Lower Manhattan. Today, that's the cast iron district of Soho. What was the vision? What was the aims of a man who would decide, for the sake of the automobile, to cut a swath across a city, across a beautiful, vibrant, bustling part of the city? And you know, Robert Moses wanted to build three expressways across New York City, not just the Lower Manhattan. He had a mid-Manhattan expressway, which would have run across 30th Street in the air. And he wanted to build one again at ground level at 125th Street, an upper Manhattan expressway. For decades, nothing had stopped the juggernaut of road building or slowed the rampage of urban renewal, which in the name of rebuilding the city, had torn the heart out of one community after another. But this time, things would turn out differently. Determined to save Manhattan from the devastation that had blighted the Bronx, residents of the village banded together and resolved to fight, selecting as their leader a 45-year-old journalist and working mother from Hudson Street, who had that very year published a groundbreaking book about the mistakes of urban planning. Her name was Jane Jacobs, the book was called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and New York would never be the same again. And it started out by saying something like, this is an attack on city planning. And then she went through the litany of what Le Corbusier and other ideologues had imagined what a city should be as opposed to what a city really was. Jane Jacobs was taking on the orthodoxies of planning that had prevailed in the post-World War II period, the ideas of Le Corbusier and the Bauhaus and, and other planners who thought that the city needed to be renewed. There were areas that, 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 that needed help, but the kind of help that she saw that they needed was uh, the assistance to allow people to continue living in their brownstones, in the neighborhoods where they had a harmony with their neighbors. And the destruction of those neighborhoods is one of the great tragedies of, of post-World War II New York. She understood that urban economies are different. She understood the sort of beehive, thousand different interdependent functions, nature of urban economies. And that's what we lose when we surrender the street to the automobile. When people don't want to be on the street anymore, when they reshape their lives in a way that they're always in privatized space, 
rather than sharing public space. Jay Jacobs knew 35 years ago that that was a recipe for the destruction of what makes cities wonderful. Look what they have built. Low-income projects that become worse centers of delinquency and vandalism than the slums they were supposed to replace. Promenades that go from no place to nowhere and have no promenaders. Expressways that eviscerate great cities. This is not the rebuilding of cities. This is the sacking of cities. Jane Jacobs. She hit the nerve at the right moment with that book. It was the right book at exactly the right moment because she made people see particulars. She made them see the street. This had been a period of urban renewal when everything was on a model, on a big plan or a drawing with overlays. And she made people look at the street and what was there. She spoke about the eyes on the street, the smaller buildings where people looked out and watched their neighbors. She spoke about the small stores, the mom and pop stores, all of the things that urban renewal not only was destroying, but didn't acknowledge existed. She basically said that from her house at 555 Hudson Street in the West Village, from the sidewalk of her block, you could observe what a whole city was like. But it returned the discussion of what urbanism should be about, what New York should be about, from big land plan games to individuals, shops, streets, cars, crosswalks, networks of people, people rich and poor living more closely together, less concerned with the elevator to the 35th floor and more concerned with the life in the five-story walk-up. Under the seeming disorder of the old city, wherever the old city is working successfully, is a marvelous order for maintaining the safety of the streets and the freedom of the city. It is a complex order. Its essence is the intricacy of sidewalk use, bringing with it a constant succession of eyes. This order is composed of movement and change, and we may liken it to the dance, not to a simple-minded precision dance, but to an intricate ballet in which the individual dancers and ensembles all have distinctive parts which miraculously reinforce each other and compose an orderly whole. Jane Jacobs. Her writing enabled people to imagine her block, but also enabled people to see, to see other blocks. She created, maybe without intending to do it, a kind of empathy and opened up possibilities for empathy as a political force in the 60s. So that once people could imagine how other people lived, even if they didn't concretely know, they could help them, they could work for them, they could work together. When she comes out with her book in 1961, it's, it's not just that it's brilliantly written, it's pithy, it's punchy, it's down to earth, uh, uh, you know, it's enjoyable, it's entertaining, it's mind capturing. It's not just that, it's that what she is doing is providing a counter narrative, a counter argument, a counter vision of what the city is. But it's a vision that says you don't want to break out manufacturing and send it off somewhere else. You don't want to, in fact, send the citizens off to the suburbs. You, what you want to have is an integrated community the way it used to be, in essence. But you want to have people in a position to walk to work. You want small-scale buildings. You want people to be able to watch the streets. I mean, crime, to some extent, is beginning to explode in the city in the 50s, and a lot of it is... You know, there certainly is the pathology of drugs and such, but it is also from shattered communities that have been renewed and removed and highwayed out and uh, are in turmoil and are about, you know, in the 60s to really explode, and not just here again, but all across the country.